Are you a science lover who is considering a career in academia? Then you must watch this video by Sabina Hosenfelder. She is a physicist who has a YouTube channel with over 1 million subscribers. She shares science news in a very, as a matter of a fact, manner. But I knew it was bullshit, just as most of the work in that area is currently bullshit, and just as most of academic research that your taxes pay for is almost certainly bullshit. Very German with very heavy German accent. In her video my dream died and now I'm here she shared her experience of the toxicity working in academia she provides really good insights in the current state of academia and why she left and I believe many of you are in the same type of agony I used to work in academia five years ago and I left to pursue a career in art so hello science people welcome to my channel my name is Zhong I'm a scientific illustrator I've been helping scientists to make professional figures for their research publication through this channel I have uploaded uploaded many tutorials so scientists can follow them and make figures by themselves. You can support my channel by giving likes, subscribe, and share my videos. Also follow my social media for my updates. I live stream on Wednesdays to answer questions about making scientific illustrations. I have selected some key moments from the video to watch it with you and I'll share some of my own experience in academic research. Let's watch the video together and have a chat. When I signed up for studying at the university, I thought being a physicist was my dream job. But here I am on YouTube. Same Sabina, same. I also ended up on YouTube. But you get more views than I do. Good for you. They were thinkers and tinkerers and had sometimes heated but usually respectful arguments. This is what I expected. Yes, that was hopelessly naive, I knew. When I started studying at the university, my expectations were based on biographies of scientists. Fans, I don't come from an academic background. I come from a family of teachers and accountants and post office workers. They're normal people. I just didn't know anyone with a PhD. So in some ways, she was tricked into academia. When you're very passionate about something, people might take advantage of that. The funny thing is, I grew up in an academic environment. Two of my family members have PhD degrees. I already know they are not normal people. But still, because of the family influence, I get pulled into it. So Sabina, don't be too hard on yourself. Anybody can fall into this trap. I was getting older and still didn't have a decent job. I made a little money by selling oil paintings. Those were the days, people. But I didn't seriously think I was a particularly good artist. I really had to get a normal job and stop asking my grandma to help out with paying rent. Sabina almost became a scientific illustrator like I am. It's funny how similar science people think, you know. <laughs> oil painting, maybe being a programmer can be a better job. I actually got a lot of DM from scientists who want to sell their artwork. It is not easy. If you have more questions, leave them in the comments. I might make a video about it. I thought that the Institute of Physics would give me a job when I'd finished my master's degree with good grades. Though technically at the time that was called a diploma. I thought they'd give me a job because that had worked for all the other students previously. If your grades were good, they'd offer you a job as a graduate student. It wasn't particularly great pay, but it was a real job. And that's where things started to go wrong. Good grades at school does not guarantee employment. This is an uncomfortable truth people are not very aware of when they're still at school. The key factors of getting a job is who you know, and whether your personality fits the company well. While I was working my research job, when we need a new hire to fill in the position, the PI will contact the previous interns first before posting a recruitment ad on the internet. This is indeed a psychological bias, but it is also a reality of human nature. By playing along with it, there's a higher chance you will get what you want. There are also other factors that will interfere the hiring decision. Sabrina will tell you the ridiculous obstacles she faced. Because I finished my exams with excellent grades. I don't mean to brag, but I think you need this context. But I wasn't offered a job because I'm a woman. I'm not guessing that that's what happened. I know because they told me. You see, the guy who was head of the institute told me that since I'm female, I should apply for a scholarship that was exclusively for women in the natural sciences. 
because then the institute wouldn't have to pay for me. This money saving practice in academia sounds crazy, but it happens all the time. Institutions prefer researchers who have their own funding, so they don't need to pay the person with their budget. The norm of the institution is they will try to budget as much as possible. And therefore, they prefer PhDs who have their own funding. I've heard about this from a friend who studied their PhD at one of the most prestige institutes. He thinks one of the main factors he gets selected is because he has a scholarship that can support his study. So guys, if you're considering applying for a PhD, try to secure a scholarship and you will have a higher chance of getting accepted. At this time, I was the only woman at the institute who was not in the administration. The next problem was that the head of the institute made a lot of money selling textbooks. He wrote very little of these textbooks himself. Rather, he gave assignments for parts of the books to students and postdocs, which is why in in case you've ever wondered, these textbooks are so discontinuous and partly repetitive. He expected me to also work for him, to which I said no. I was then ordered into his office, in which he gave me a very angry speech, according to which I wasn't loyal to all the other students who did their part. I told him that I was under no obligation to work for him and didn't care what the rest of the students were thinking. He got angry, I laughed at him, he started shouting that I was fired and physically shoved me out of his office. True story. This is an outright exploitation of the students. If you're in a working environment like this, find a new job immediately. It is not good to stay there. The supervisor tried to intimidate Sabina into submission. This is so bad. What he was doing is called coercive control. If someone behaves like this, they're not normal. Sabina was right to say no and standing up for herself. I think she is a very good example of how to deal with these situations. I'm not just telling you this because it's entertaining. It was also a rather rude awakening. It made me realize that this institute wasn't about knowledge discovery. It was about money making. And the more I saw of academia, the more I realized it wasn't just this particular institute and this particular professor. It was generally the case. The moment you put people into big institutions, the goal shifts from knowledge discovery to money making. Here's how this works. If a researcher gets a scholarship or research grant, then the institution gets part of that money. It's called the overhead. Technically, that's meant to pay for offices and equipment and administration, etc. But academic institutions then pay part of their staff from this overhead. So they need to keep that overhead coming. Sabina explains really well how the academic industrial complex works. This system wants scientists who can bring in the most grant to the institution. Many of my viewers are early career scientists. I'll explain what a grant is, in case you have not yet worked in a lab as a profession. Grant means money. I know it's a shock for a lot of people. You need to spend money to do science. Yes, and it is very expensive. But research grants can be tens of millions of dollars, and the overhead can be anything between 15 and 50 percent. YouTube take 45 percent of my ad revenue. Isn't content creator very similar to professors? They all create content to feed their audience, so they will donate money to the creator. And the institution the scientists work at is very similar to platforms like YouTube and TikTok. They will take a cut from the donation. You can now see clearly why institutions would favor scientists who can secure the most grants, because that means the institutions can take more cuts and more more revenue. A scientific research job is not as purely scientific as most of the people would think. But if you can enjoy the game and play it well, you will do very well in academia. The overhead isn't even the real problem. The real problem is that the easiest way to grow in academia is to pay other people to produce papers on which you, as the grant holder, can put your name. That's how academia works. Grants pay students and postdocs to produce research papers for the grant holder. And those papers are what the supervisor then uses to apply for more grants. The result is a paper production machine in which students and stocks are burned through to bring in money for the institution. Here's another hard truth you must know. A PhD is not 
only for studying. It is a job to produce paper so your supervisor can apply for more grants. If you have your expectation in the right place, you will not get traumatized when you enter the system. The real problem I had, I think, is that I was bad at lying to myself. Of course, I try to tell myself and anyone who was willing to listen that at least unofficially on the side, I do the research that I thought was worth my time, but that I couldn't get money for because it was too far off the mainstream. But that research never got done because I had to do the other stuff that I actually got paid for. Here's another hard truth she brought up. If you do what you like, you normally don't get paid. <laughs> does not only apply to research topics, but also when people try to turn their hobby into a job. Yeah, just like trying to sell your art into making a living. It is not easy. Please do not think that my experience with academia is universal or that I've claimed it is. I know many people who love academia the way it is and who think it's working just fine. I'm just not one of them. Indeed, there are people who suit academia well, like my family members. Their personality is high in agreeableness and conscientiousness. They can do quite well in academia. As Jordan Peterson's research show, these two personality traits can predict higher performance in a academic setting. And clearly, Sabina is a rather disagreeable person. Otherwise, she will not fight back to the abusive boss. Good for her. I'm not sure if I'm going to post this video. It's a bit too much, isn't it? She uploaded the video anyway, and I'm glad she did. Go watch the video, science people, so she can save your career.